हेलो व्यूअर्स माय नेम इज डॉक्टर मनोज सेमवाल आई एम अ मेडिकल फिजिसिस्ट एंड अ रेडियोलॉजिकल सेफ्टी ऑफिसर एट आर्मी हॉस्पिटल रिसर्च एंड रेफरल डेली कंट्रोलमेंट इन द रेडिएशन प्रोटेक्शन मॉड्यूल वी विल डिस्कस टुडे अबाउट वेरियस फेसिट्स ऑफ रेडिएशन प्रोटेक्शन वी विल डिस्कस द रैशनेल ऑफ वाई there should be permissible limit for radiation is there any regulatory framework and also we will discuss what type of radiations are used in various application of human activity and how do you guarantee or ensure protection from these radiation so certain basic principles of radiation protection permissible limit what are the regulatory laws internationally and what are they in india this all we will be discussing with you but the basic premise is why do you require radiation protection and radiation protection from what we all know that radiation can cause harm and the harm can be long term and short term the problem with radiation is that the harm is not immediately known that is the reason that you have to have a framework of radiation protection processes procedures in place before any harm occurs because generally we in the field of radiation protection say that radiation harm is irreversible most of the time so it is always good to have safety measures to have precautionary measures from radiation before the harm occurs and we know that radiation is being used in many fields today not only in medical field radiation is used in industry we are all are familiar with nuclear energy where lot of radiation is involved then we have heard about nuclear accidents we have heard about many many past human related accidents like atomic bomb so we know what harm radiation in cock can cause what are the potential hazards of it not only real hazards but what are the potentials where radiation hazard can take place and regulatory laws ensure that those potential radiation hazards don't occur so in this module i'll be discussing not only of the concepts and principles of radiation protection i'll be talking about the regulatory framework and the third and final we will be discussing about permissible limits which you will be hearing quite frequently but at the same time paradoxically you will be hearing or in a module i may discuss with you that there is no threshold dose below which radiation effects don't take place so these paradoxes also we will try to resolve when we discuss about permissible limits of radiation so to reframe our objectives once again in this module the audience will be familiarized with hazards of ionizing radiation how do you evaluate radiation hazards and what is the regulatory framework of radiation protection in this country and what are the permissible limits in the field of radiation protection how do you define protection the international atomic energy agency defines radiation protection as the protection of people from harmful effects of exposure to ionizing radiation and the means for achieving this and here what is implicit is not only the protection of human beings but also the protection of environment now what is ionizing radiation from which we are talking about protection radiation having sufficient energy to remove bound electrons from atomic cells such as ultraviolet radiation x rays and gamma rays they are ionizing radiation in addition you must have heard about other radioactive nuclear radiations for example alpha rays beta rays cosmic rays they are all ionizing radiation and how do you define ionizing radiation what is the threshold of ionization just for your information the threshold of energy for ionization from a water molecule is about 12.6 electron volt so any radiation which has energy more than this 
will be called as ionizing radiation in the context of water and why water is important because more than two third of our body or cells is water so any ionization caused there will be harmful for the body now in the electromagnetic spectrum starting right away from radio waves up to cosmic waves all is radiation but all this radiation is not ionizing radiation as just i was discussing with you so it is only above the energy above the visible spectrum that means starting from ultraviolet radiation that we talk about ionizing radiation below this there is radiation which is used in television radar mri and also form of radio wave communication though nowadays you must be reading articles or hearing debates in electronic medium about harmful effect of mobile radiation which is a radio wave so there but the effect of radio wave on human beings is little different from ionizing radiation and hence we will not be covering that radiation the radio wave radi microwave radiation in this module so before progressing further on radiation protection let's have a brief look radiation units that will help us later on dealing with permissible limits and other issues of radiation protection so first quantity that came into picture was called exposure and it was amount of radiation existing at a point how did one measure it it was measured in terms of the ionization produced by the radiation in air so the earlier definition of exposure and the unit for it was assigned as ronjan in honor of the famous scientist ronjan the discoverer of x-rays so one ronjan earlier was defined as one esu of charge that is one electrostatic unit of charge collected per cc of air at normal temperature and pressure but now in si unit this translates into one ronjan is equal to 2.58 into 10 raised to power minus 4 coulomb per kg of charge collected so that's one ronjan of exposure another unit for radiation measurement is dose it is a measure of radiation absorbed by a target medium that is radiation energy absorbed in a medium its unit earlier units was rad and present day unit is gray so one rad was 100 ergs of energy deposited per unit mass that is per gram of medium si unit is 1 joule of energy per kg of medium that will be called 1 gray of radiation but the most relevant radiation units and quantities prevalent in radiation protections are equivalent dose and effective dose what is an equivalent dose dose in tissue or organ when absorbed dose which was measured in gray is multiplied by a factor called radiation weighing factor or wr then it is called equivalent dose and why has this radiation weighing factor come because the different type of radiation have different type of biological effect for the same amount of dose absorbed that is why each type of radiation has been assigned a radiation weighing factor and in radiation protection we are bothered about radiation effect that is why when the absorbed dose is multiplied by the radiation weighing factor it is called equivalent dose so equivalent dose is radiation weight weighing factor multiplied by dose absorbed in a tissue or organ in a human being or any other medium second is effective dose this is to account for varying tissue sensitivities in the body all tissues in the body are not equally sensitive to radiation or in other words they do it, they don't contribute to the detriment human health detriment equally for example our extremities are less radiation sensitive as compared to our stem cells or gonadal cells so each tissue or organ has also been assigned a tissue weighing factor depending on its sensitivity so now if you multiply the equivalent dose with tissue weighing factor you end up with effective dose and this is the quantity that is of very high importance to us and the unit for this has been called as sievert on in short sv this so this is the most important quantity in radiation protection 
the quantity is effective dose and its unit is sievert. What are the various radiation weighing factors and tissue weighing factors? International Commission on Radiation Protection in its report number 103 issued in 2007 has assigned radiation weighing, different radiation weighing factor for different type of radiation. For example, photons. What is photon? X-rays and gamma rays, the radiation weighing factor is 1. Similarly, for electrons, it is 1. For protons and charged particles, it is 2 lighter charged particles. For alpha and heavy charged particles, it can reach up to 20. And for neutrons, depending on its energy, the radiation weighing factor can range from 2 to 20. That means, in simple terms, what it means is same amount of radiation dose of X-rays or alpha rays will be radiobiologically very different. An alpha ray with a radiation weighing factor of 20 will be 20 times more biologically effective than a photon X-ray. Now, coming to tissue weighing factors, what ICRP says, tissues or organisms in the body, that is bone marrow, colon, lung, stomach, breast, have been assigned a tissue weighing factor of 0.12. Gonads have been assigned tissue weighing factor of 0.08. And similarly, bladder, esophagus, liver, thyroid have been assigned a factor of 0.04. Bone surface, brain, salivary gland and skin have been assigned 0.01 as tissue weighing factor. So you see the difference, the range for bone marrow at one end the tissue weighing factor is 0.12 and for skin at the other end it is 0.01. So that is the sensitivity of these two tissues as far as harm to body is concerned from radiation. Now coming to sources of radiation, what are the sources to which mankind is exposed to? One is called natural or background radiation. This can again be categorized as terrestrial radiation. Where, is, where does it come from? It comes from building material containing radon, presence of radioactive minerals in a region. For example, monazite sand deposits in Kerala coast having radionucleides of thorium-232 decay making the background five to six times more. So Kerala coast has natural background radiation five to six times than in the rest of the India or many parts of the world. Then what is the other form of natural background radiation? Cosmic rays. They are more at higher altitude. Third, and they are extraterrestrial. Third is internal. Where is that radiation internally? It is in our bones and various body tissues, mainly potassium-40, which is a radioactive isotope of potassium. Similarly, carbon-14. So these are two radioactive isotopes of normal carbon and normal potassium, and they are in our body. You must have heard the term carbon dating. So carbon dating is based on the content of carbon-14 and the ratio of carbon-14 with respect to carbon-12. And from there, one can determine the age of any fossil. Then, apart from natural or background radiation, the other source of radiations are generically called as anthropogenic radiation. That means man-made radiation. And they are in nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, medical exposures, nucleonic gauges, research in nuclear material and life sciences. So, all these constitute man-made radiation sources. What is, just to give you an idea, what is the average annual effective dose from natural sources which cannot be avoided? So natural radiation cannot be avoided and let us see what is the dose, effective dose from all these natural sources. For example, Kerala coast in India, as I was talking to you a little earlier, has a natural background radiation of 12.5 millisievert per year. So each person living in that region received at least this much dose. And we will later on contrast this amount of natural background radiation with the permissible limit of radiation. And then we will try to argue why the permissible limit are kept at the level as they are.
in china certain region has 6.3 millisievert per year as natural background radiation and it can be as low as 1.25 millisievert per year at, in vancouver canada so there is a wide range even of natural background radiation and to add to that if you fly high at a higher altitude because of higher cosmic ray exposure natural background radiation also increases so all these data i am telling you for the ground stations now we must know certain agencies or organizations that are involved in radiation protection worldwide one of the most important one is the international commission on radiological protection also called as icrp it is a non profit non government org organization established in 1928 it is an advisory body offering its recommendations to regulatory and advisory agencies mainly by providing guidance on the fundamental principles on which radiation protection can be based the recommendations as reports are published by icrp from time to time in the in its journal called annals of the icrp the last comprehensive rep, such such a report on radiation protection was released by icrp in 2007 and it is called the 2007 recommendations of the icrp in its report number 103 which supersedes its report earlier report report number 60 issued in 1990 so most of the regulations permissible limits and other recommendation worldwide by adopted by different countries are mainly based on the icrp recommendation so what are the regulatory laws in india on radiation protection the foremost and important law, law is the atomic energy act 1962 activities concerning establishment and utilization of radiation facilities and use of radioactive sources are to be carried out in india in accordance with the provision of this act which is atomic energy act 1962 from this act are derived various rules for example the most important radiation protection rules 2004 also referred to as rpr 2004 which are in vogue today these rules apply to all practices adopted and all interventions applied with respect to radiation sources so who is the competent authority in india to implement the radiation protection rules the agency is called atomic energy regulatory board this agency is entrusted with the responsibility of laying down safety standards and enforcing rules and regulations for such activities in pursuance of ensuring safety of members of the public and occupational workers as well as protection of environment so this safety ensures not only protection of public and the occupational worker but also of the environment how does aerb accomplish its task what it does it aerb issues safety codes for different practices radiation practices from time to time and these codes safety codes contain comprehensive guidelines for each practice that is how to get a license to operate a radiation equipment what should be the physical infrastructure what should be the manpower training what kind of shielding and other radiation protection measures radiation monitoring personal monitoring and reporting and record keeping should be carried out before an institution starts a radiation practice all this is contained in the safety codes of aerb and the three important persons that have been assigned responsibilities and role for ensuring radiation protection in these codes are the employer the licensee and the radiological safety officers so all responsibilities for ensuring safe radiation practice fall on these three categories of persons now you can divide radiation exposure in three categories one is the occupational exposure that means this is the radiation exposure received by the professionals engaged in radiation activities for example a radiologist 
a radiographer or a radiation oncologist or workers in a nuclear reactor. So whatever radiation they receive during their as part of their profession are called occupational exposures. Then there are public exposures. What are public exposures? That surrounding a nuclear facility, there are common people living who have nothing to do with the nuclear facility. But because of certain radiation levels occurring around that area, they would also be receiving radiation. Or for that matter, around any radiation facility, there is general public which is neither directly nor indirectly involved in that radiation facility, but on account of existence of this facility, receive certain radiation. That is public exposure. Then third category of exposures is medical exposure of patients. And that also includes the comforters of the patient, the carers of the patient, other than the, of course, the occupational. Carers in th this case would be relatives of the patient or the friends of the patient. And of course, the research volunteers who are engaged in certain research and who know about the radiation effect may still take part in the research. So third, three categories, occupational exposure, public exposure, and medical exposure of patient. Similarly, there are three principles of radiation protection. One is justification, second is optimization, and third is limiting the dose, that is called dose limits. Just as I mentioned, justification. So for that, I have to say what are unjustified practices, that means Whenever a radiation activity is to be carried out, there has to be a justification for it. For example, addition of radioactivities in commodities and consumer products is not a justified activity. Radiological exposures for any purpose without any clinical evaluation of the images or clinical indication is not a justified practice. Mass screening of population groups unless for detecting diseases and its control if detected, if that does not happen, then again, it's not a justified practice. So there has to be a justification for any practice. To give you a clinical example, all may be familiar with ultrasonography, which does not involve any ionizing radiation. Whereas a chest X-ray, a pelvis X-ray, or a CT scan involves ionizing radiation. So if a certain information can be gathered through ultrasound, then it will be unjustified to use an ionizing radiation for the purpose. So a clinician should be aware of this fact. Now, there are three parameters for radiation protection. What are they? We normally in radiation protection field call them time, distance and shading. Time means reduce the time in the radiation field. Lesser one a radiation workers remain in the radiation field, the less amount of radiation will he receive. And this relationship of exposure versus time is very linear. So one is aware. The second parameter is distance. That means maintain a safe distance from the radiation source. In this case, distance is a very critical parameter. With distance, radiation exposure decreases or increases as inverse square law. That means if you increase the distance of a person from the radiation source by twofold, the exposure to the patient goes down by fourfold. So it is a very effective mean of reducing exposure. Third is of course, so at all places, neither will you be able to reduce time, nor will you be able to reduce distance beyond a certain limit. So then what else you can do? You can use shielding. That means you can use protective barriers. And here, the reduction in the amount of radiation, attenuation of radiation, especially electromagnetic radiation, is exponential. So time, distance, and shielding are three parameters on which one can protect either a patient or a radiation worker or the public. You must have seen if you go to a clinical environment, radiographer wearing lead aprons or in the nuclear medicine lab, a radiation worker working behind a lead shield protecting herself or himself from radiation or in an interventional lab where cardiac catheterization, for example, angiography is done, the radiologist is not only wearing lead aprons, he is also wearing lead goggles so that his eyes also receive lead, less radiation. And why lead? Because lead is a very good shielding material for x-rays. Now, this is the part of parameters for use for protection. Then let's briefly discuss about 
what harm the radiation can cause. So what are the radiation effects? Radiation effects can be broadly categorized into two fields. One is called stochastic or probabilistic effects. That means effects for which probability of an effect and not its severity is regarded a function of dose without threshold. That means there is no threshold dose below which these effects do not occur. They can occur at any low dose as well. Only thing is that probability or frequency of occurrence will be low at low doses. And what are these effects? Malignant diseases, hereditary diseases. So how do you estimate these risks? So there are risk coefficients associated with probabilistic effects. And I have discussed about radiation carcinogenesis in another module for you. This is one of the probabilistic effects. Then there are deterministic effects or also called as non-stochastic effects. This results from injury in a population of cells and characterized by a threshold dose. So below a threshold dose, these effects generally do not happen. Their severity increases with dose. They are, these deterministic effects are also termed as tissue reaction. So just to give you an example of uh, some deterministic and stochastic effects, for example, skin erythema is a deterministic effect and the threshold dose is between 2 to 5 gray. So this effect will not be seen unless the patient receives 2 to 5 gray of radiation. Similarly, hair loss cannot be seen below a dose of 2 to 5 gray. Cataract cannot be seen below 5 gray. Sterility, temporary sterility in humans cannot be seen below a dose of 2 to 3 gray. And lethal dose, 50-30, that means 50% lethality in 30 days to whole body of a human being will not occur below a dose of 3 to 5 gray. Similarly, for probabilistic effect, what are the risk coefficients? For example, for cancer, the risk coefficient is 5.5% per sievert. That means out of 100 people who receive 1 sievert of dose, 5.5 may develop cancer at a later date. Similarly, 0.2 can may develop a hereditary effect out of 100 people if they receive one sievert dose. Now, this is the concept of detriment of ICRP for stochastic effect is the probability of fatality attributable to radiation exposure, the weighted probability of non-fatal cancers, the weighted probability of severe hereditary effects, the length of lifetime lost if the harm occurs. So, these are this all involves what is the health detriment caused by radiation. Now, what are the permissible limits of radiation? For a radiation worker or occupational worker, the effective dose should is 20 millisievert per year. So, this is the permissible limit in India. For public, it is 1 millisievert. Eye dose, equivalent dose to lens of eye, can be up to 150 millisievert for a radiation worker and 50 millisievert for a public member of public. Similarly, equivalent dose to extremities, body extremities, could be 500 millisievert for radiation worker, 50 millisievert for public. Now, what does these permissible limits tell us? That to ensure that deterministic effects are essentially avoided and risk of probabilistic effect should not be greater than the average risk of accidental death among workers in safe industry. And for those limits, the total risk coefficient is assumed to be 10 raised to power minus 2 per sievert excluded are please remember medical exposures public exposures in emergency situation and existing exposure situation so what is safe industry fatality fatal risk fatality risk less than one per ten thousand per year that is safe industry trade in u.s data says trade has 0.5 per thousand per ten thousand and radiation industry has 0.3 per ten thousand what is existing exposure situation Red, for example, red on in dwellings and workplaces, residues in the environment due to emission from passive operations, contaminated territories resulting from accidents. So they are ex existing exposure situation. When they are high, they may warrant radiological protection as well. There are radiation warning symbols that should be placed. This is one measure of radiation protection. And of course, they have to be pasted as visible places. To summarize radiation protection measures, one should have a trained radiation professionals in the field working. They are authorized by Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. Number two, the radiation facility should also be 
as per the guidelines or safety codes of AERB that is the shielding, the monitoring equipment and all safety measures should be in place. Regular quality assurance of the radiation generating equipment and of the entire practice should be carried out at periodic intervals. All equipment should be calibrated, radiation measuring equipment should be calibrated. Radiation warning symbols should be placed at ubiquitous places for the public and for also all the radiation workers. The radiation workers should follow the practice of ensuring safety as per the guidelines. Thank you.